Hey, I'm Dan, and if you're new to homebrewing, so am I. Welcome to my adventures in homebrewing. Hey, everybody, it's Dan, and it's that time once more to go around the world one more time and have a beer or two along the way. Thank you very much for coming out and joining me this week. I need to say thank you to BrewTuber and new friend uh, Dennis Penn for being on the show last week. Fantastic guy. Folks, if you ever get a chance, go check out the BrewTubers on YouTube wealth and knowledge and i'm very fortunate to see to say that i am now one of them with some of the videos and things that i have done so check them out honestly welcome it's a pretty much an international group guys honestly any question you have they'll answer it uh this week we are very fortunate to have a local homebrew shop that i've been dealing with in toronto um a lot lately because i've been finding that their service uh not only customer service and getting back to me and uh just be, overall being patience with my OCD has been uh, fantastic. And I'm talking about the Toronto Brewing, uh, Toronto Brewing Home Brew Shop down in Toronto. And we're fortunate to have the owner, Zach, with us. Zach, how you doing, bud? Good, good. Thanks for having me. No, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day. I know you guys are very busy, especially with the new storefront opening up. Uh, how's that going? It's going really well. We're open and... Uh... We're excited to be on Geary Avenue and uh, have a bottle shop there as well. Oh, fantastic. So how about you tell us a little bit about yourself and how Toronto Brewing came to be? Um, you know, in short, about 10 years ago, I fell out of love with my cubicle job and in love with beer and brewing at the same time. And I think before I bottled my first batch of homebrew, I knew I, I just wanted to do it full time. And one thing led to another and I started up a little homebrew supply store uh, basement uh, garage style and uh, you know fast forward we've now got a second store and uh, we're working with 20 other people so it's it's grown a lot since then. Oh fantastic so <clears throat> I think we're going to delve into today a little bit of what you guys are seeing for changing trends and say like uh, maybe beers or even equipment that are coming along the lines. Because I, I know when I first started back way back in the early or late 90s, yeah, I'm old, um, things have changed drastically. So now when I first started, it was always you crack open a can of liquid malt, you put it in a, in a pot, you boil it, dump it in a bucket, swamp cool it, and hope to God it works. Things have changed drastically from being a three-tier system to uh, to cooler cooler systems to all-in-one electrics to all-in-one electric system. It's it is a wealth of things out there right now. But I gotta say, th from when I started back into it like two years ago, things have drastically changed over like just a two-year period. So, what are you guys seeing changing in gear from saying from? uh just the basic uh brew side to the actual fermentation side yeah you know i think the difference between another difference between now and the 90s aside from really fresh great ingredients you know like your shirt escarpment labs uh yeah having access to local liquid yeast cultures 200 billion yeast cells per mm -hmm. pitch you don't need to make a starter um, and it, it's just incredible. So I, I think the ability to, to, you know, great ingredients, make mm -hmm. great gear, make great food, and that's what it all comes from. And also with the advent of the interwebs, you are able to become an expert on the topic pretty quick. And with, you know, GTA Brews Homebrew Club and all the great resources online at Reddit, you're able to... Uh, not only converse with people in real time about your real time issues and troubleshoot, but you're able to look back over the last 10 years of these threads and troubleshooting with that. So, so that's, you know, why I think you'll see people within one or two years time go from their first batch to brewing Brett, Fike, Copitch, Dry Hop, whatever, you know, there's no, the learning curve is steep. You just get right into it. Yeah. I totally agree. I mean, yeah, the guys at Escarpment are fantastic. I, I get to call them friends now with all the, with the amount of time I've been, I've had them on my show and yeah. also doing some experiments with them where they've said, Hey, look, if you got an experiment, let us know. We'll give you the yeast as long as, you know, you send us the beer and you have us on the show, whatever. So it's been 
been fantastic. But what are you seeing changing in, say, in equipment? I mean, is there has been a lot of changes or minimal changes or? Yeah, for sure. Um, so something like the Grain Father or the Robo Brew. Yeah. You have the all in one system. So you get to ditch your, you know, my first setup was a turkey fryer from Bass Pro Shops. Yep. Um, and then you had your igloo cooler or your Coleman cooler, and you've got a couple of propane tanks and then another kettle. So now you could have like the Robo Brew or Brewzilla Grain Father, and they're all in one systems, and you don't have to deal with propane or multiple kettles or coolers. And it's super easy to clean and get a batch done. A lot of it's kind of automated, so it cuts down on the time of your brew day. Um, and then there's also things like spike equipment, uh, SS Brewtech, where you have temperature control and you have oxygenless mm -hmm. uh, transfer. So closed pressure transfer systems, which for making IPAs and hazy it's stuff. It's essential. Like that, it's essential. Yeah, you can't, you shouldn't even attempt to make it without closed pressure transfer. Or it'll be disappointed. It'll, your beer will be gray. It'll turn purple and gray. Yeah, yeah. I found that out the hard way. <laughs> same, yeah, same. <laughs> so um, I have noticed there, um, I guess it's the uh, company called Brewbuilt. And they're coming out with a series of fermenters where they're, Heating and cooling is all built into the system. Have you cool. seen that? Uh, no, I haven't seen it. Let me let me check. So I think it's one Brewer. part Brewbill. I think it's part of their pro series where they're they're conicals, and I think you get them from I think from 14, 14 gallons and up. And the cooling and the heating is like a like on an attachment or a pod on the side of the unit, and it looks pretty cool. But to me, that me that me, it makes me think there's there's a whole lot that could go wrong with it. <laughs> yeah, as long as it's modular, um, and you can just pop it off and pop on a fresh one if it. Yeah, I, I don't think so. <laughs> Version, I see it's X one. X2. Yeah. X two will have the the modular system that you can just pop on and off. The glycol chiller, it seems. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only issue with the Brusil and the Grainfather is the heating element is like built in, mm -hmm. which isn't a good thing. You want it to all be modular so you could just unscrew something. Sw swap stuff out. Just yeah. Swap out. Yeah. I, I, I fried the board on my Robo Brew, like because I had like the Gen 3, and yeah. I was right in the middle of a brew day, and all I heard was a big wonk. And I'm like, oh, there was no power, no nothing. I'm like, okay. Uh, and I was like, why am I smelling this? Took it all apart after I saved the beer, hopefully. And the board was completely fried. It fried the board. It fried the screen. I'm like, oh, no. So I tried I tried to replace the, the, the screen and the parts like it says, because everything else was working. And still no joy. I kept getting an error code, and I couldn't clear the code. So, yeah. Grandfather, three-year warranty. <laughs> I can't afford a grandfather. <laughs> you can't afford not to get a grandfather. Okay, well, I got a Brusilla now. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, the Brusilla is uh, great, great value. So you got you got the Brusilla after the Robo Brew. Oh, so you're good. Great. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I didn't need to have like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and. All yeah. that because I usually when I'm doing Brian Broody, I'm usually hanging out in the garage anyway, just yeah. so I could have my 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 mental health time away from my family. <laughs> because I every understand. now because everything right now with, with lockdown, you need that little bit of time just to yourself to keep your I sanity. Understand. Yes, I understand. So what have you seen for drastic changes in the homebrew world? Um I think people are just getting really advanced. I'm always, I'm always surprised by the systems people get. People go all in, and people aren't afraid to, you know, um, invest in a nice piece of equipment. Like you, the Robo Brew is an, an investment, you know, the yes. Brazil, uh, and people are doing that. And before it was maybe piece together everything for as cheap as you can, and. Now, I think people, that's still part of the spirit of the hobby, but I think people definitely want to uh, 
you know, uh, treat themselves or, um, you know, buy something that they know will help them brew great beer, uh, yeah. great equipment, great quality equipment, great beer, um, and just making the process easier. And it, yeah, aside from ingredients, I think just more advanced equipment, you've got the closed pressure transfer, you've got, uh, you know, high pressure fermentation, you've got all this stuff. So all the equipment's out there, like the spike stuff is, uh, pro equipment it's it's the same exact same tank but just really really small i gotta say the flex plus that i got from you guys is working fantastic i've already put it through its paces but now that i've got the cooling coil and everything for it and i've got everything the coils for all the tanks i have i get to use my glycol chiller finally so nice I'm looking looking forward to that because uh, i got the ice max four from brew built so everything's all the pumps, everything are all already built into it. And each tank has its own individual controller, which is kind of nice. Awesome. So things are going to go a little bit better when it comes on the temperature control side. So we'll see what happens. But what are you seeing people buying more of? Is it like all in one electric systems? Is it uh, three tier? Is it the three vessel systems? Because I know a lot of people have their own comfort zones. Like some people like having that HLT where they can control it and do whatever, or like the all easy all in one where it's just one vessel to clean and vice two or three. What are you seeing people buy a lot of? Yeah, people definitely buy a lot of grandfathers, robo brews, a lot of spike stuff. Um, yeah, people are definitely into those. And I've run the grandfather myself. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's, it reinvigorated my desire to brew after having you know, being kind of fatigued by the, the all of the equipment, you know, um, two propane tanks, a burner, a couple of kettles, the cooler. Uh, it's a lot. So the Robo Brew and Brusilla and Grandfather are fantastic. And that's, I think a lot of people are starting to go that way, especially when they're looking to upgrade to the next level or even downgrade from a 15 or 10 gallon setup. It's a great way to go. It's mm -hmm really really easy and uh easy to clean great repeatability and uh yeah then they transfer to yeah like the spike flex spike conicals ss brew tech and you've got all the temperature control brew built stuff like that i think that's really great because you know it comes down to fermentation temperature control yeah. and you know control of the yeast and really dialing that in and uh also getting it in and out of the fermenter is important as well so uh, what was it? you gotta forgive me every now and then i've got those moments where it's right there i'm gonna ask a question and then it's gone <sighs> falling on my head one too many times jumping out of planes sorry <laughs> just give me a minute but um what are some of the things that you find people are doing wrong when it comes to getting into the hobby and they are people a little too gung-ho and just spending a lot of money in there like i don't know what i did wrong and then scrap it all and get frustrated and move away or are they asking questions before they actually go and buy everything yeah pe people ask us a lot of questions anyone who works at toronto brewing will tell you people really they they see what they are looking for and then that, that's really part of the 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 reason why homebrew shops exist you need to have people to talk to and talk through all this equipment and just make sure you're getting the right thing and getting everything and all these little parts and things like that. So, you know, I think people don't do a lot of stuff wrong. People research really thoroughly. And as long as you research thoroughly, you ask a lot of questions. Um, everyone at Toronto Brewing is there to, you know, help you out and make sure you're not buying. We're like, like a fiduciary in that we're, you're, we're here with your best interests so you don't buy any more or any less than you should mm -hmm. you know is there, any, is there anybody that you've had to scale back um yeah you know sometimes people come in and they're looking at the green father and they're like you know it's a little intimidating and you say you know you could definitely just get by with the cheapest kettle and a nylon bag for five dollars and brew mm -hmm. your first batch so, you, you know, just get the fir first batch, you might screw something up anyways, or boil the grain or something like that. So just get it under your belt and get it done and then do some research and take the next step. 
So one thing I have been seeing is that because I've been really wanting to get um, the 65 liter Bruzilla. I yeah. really want to get my hands on that thing, Big but guy. it's but it's not certified for Canada. Then it seems to be there's a lot of things that are not being certified to be used in Canada. Is there any particular reason why? Is it because like the Americans okay. want 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 everything to be held there, or is there anything here in Canada that we can have that's equivalent to that stuff? It just costs money. Okay, that's that's um, the... yeah, it costs money. So sometimes they're just like, well. I don't know how many, you know, 60 liter Brusillas we're going to sell. So is it worth the investment to get it certified and the time investment to get it certified in Canada? Right. It's already certified in the States. We're 10 million people or 30 million people. They're 300 yeah. something million people. So I just don't think people sometimes it's just on not on the top list of things to do for people. Right. Because because I know he, where I am in Ottawa, there's a lot of us that want those bigger systems because it makes it easier for when we do things like, in, like say, like Imperial uh, or big beers that are high ABV because sure, I can do it in the in my little robo brew, but I ha would have to do it like half batches to get what I need. Vice exactly. one batch with all the grain that I need, one go and stop. And the fact that it's like you, you need that 220 input is also kind of hard because then you got to get things wired into your house and whatnot. But I can understand because that's drawing a lot of power. You need 220. Yeah. 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 So is, is there anything wrong with a person, say, if they go into the States, they buy that? and then bring it back is it like use it at your own risk because it's not certified in canada yeah official corporate statement from toronto brewing is only use certified electronics that have been certified for use in canada okay right. um, again that being said you know it is simply a component of your overall brewery and if you had an electrician come and make sure that everything was set up okay at home, then I think you're okay for at-home use, mm -hmm. especially since they are still fully certified for use in America. They're UL certified. Um, if you're a brewery, you must have it certified because they will inspect it. And there's yeah. that's without question. Yeah, because I was looking at getting um, the SS uh, BrewTech mill the new one they have yeah. that big black one yeah and looks like, awesome. yeah yeah and they're like yeah it's not certified for canada and if you're getting it for your brewery you need to make sure it gets certified and i'm like yeah it's it's true. For, it's for my home so it's yeah i don't think i need to get it certified for my house so but yeah i don't think so either although it's always good to make sure that your yeah. electric components are up to code official statement so what is selling more, electric gear or non-electric gear these days? You know, it's a long tail of uh, items that we provide at Toronto Brewing and people seem to be, you know, the, the, everyone comes in different shapes and sizes. People are brewing one gallon at a time and people are brewing 50 gallons at a time. So it, it's really all over the place. You couldn't say one or the other. It's, it's a mix of everything, actually. Okay, so, <clears throat> oh boy, I'm losing all kinds of questions here because you're answering them like that. This is awesome. <laughs> I, just, I just had two espressos. I'd be climbing the walls. <laughs> I'd be passed out if I, I wasn't, you know? Uh, so you guys have been fantastic. I, I cannot speak any more highly, you guys. Um, I mean, I've dealt with someone else, I believe, who's in Toronto. We won't say who that is because I've dealt with them. They're, they're nice people, but they're not the same level as you guys. I'm pretty sure you might have an idea who I'm talking about. It starts with an O. <laughs> so, but I find you guys are, not only are you, prompt and getting back to people but you do give solutions and you're personable this is what i like um it's not just a generic 
uh, say message or whatever else. There's there's solutions. There's people who they're really honestly willing and wanting to help you. Um, like I've dealt with um, Trevor and John, and they have been fantastic. So please tell them thank you for all their help. Uh, I greatly sure. appre- I greatly appreciate all their help and their patience with me because uh, I'll I'll say this I am a retired military guy so uh, timings are like a hard thing for me to let go so when you get told okay this is when it's going to be and it's just like okay timings timings here now it's like is it here is it here so, please apologize for me because it's it's part of my military OCD that I have a very hard time letting go of. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> Because I'm pretty sure they're playing this guy fucking stop emailing. <laughs> so um, what are some of the newest things coming on the line that people seem to be buying a lot of? Uh, you know, Escarpment Labs yeast. Mm-hmm. I would say uh, their latest fight ring and all their latest yeast uh, offerings are, are pretty hot and pretty cool. And that's definitely something that's really exciting right now. I got friends in Colorado begging me to send them like a uh, crispy yeast to them. Yeah. And I'm like, I yeah. can't, it will not survive. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, if we could get our hit, they're like, just dry it out. Send it to us, please. We're dying for this stuff because like, I guess uh, Scarpman is just starting to um, service along the border States with with yeast that are close to us like down and through new york and a few other places and and a buddy of mine colter he has a podcast called homebrewing diy and he loves doing um pseudo loggers like under pressure and he uses the crispy kvike yeast and he loves the stuff and he's like just send me whatever you can and i'm like i don't usually have a lot left over or i save a lot for myself for the next batch yeah so do you find a lot of people are buying uh, the liquid yeasts versus dry yeast because i know personally i love liquid yeasts especially the escarpment lab stuff because like you said before you don't need a starter you just give it a good shake there's 200 billion cells in there you drop it in and you're pretty much guaranteed it's going to work so yeah yeah, for sure. Uh, I would say that that is really popular. And uh, yeah, the Escarpment Labs yeast stuff is just great. And it's it's definitely worth the extra five bucks over a pack of uh, dry yeast. But there are actually some great dry yeast now as well. There's Lalamand, uh, Voss, Quike. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really popular. Philly Sour is really popular. Yep. Um, yeah. I've used yeah. the Philly Sour. It's actually I did it with did a uh, Berliner with that, and it actually worked out pretty good. I just think next time I might use two packs just to give that little extra sour, and add some more a little extra fruit to it just to give it a little extra tart, and it should work out. Yeah, for sure, for sure. That's super popular right out of the gate. Right on. What are you finding that's coming online, maybe, or what are some of the grains that seem to be I mean, obviously two row and pilsner are obviously ones that are used a lot, but what are you finding for grains that people seem to be gravitating to a lot of? Because I mean, other than base malts, the specialty malts are like the ones that people really need to bring out that distinct characters of certain beers. For sure, um, it's funny with. You know, hazy IPAs, people actually don't use a lot of specialty grains. Um, mm. It's a lot of two-row, a little wheat, flaked wheat. So a lot of flaked wheat, flaked oats, stuff like that. Um, honey malt for darker malts or darker beers. Really like to push people in the direction of some Thomas Fawcett ones like brown malt and pale mm. chocolate over old school ones like black and chocolate um the pale chocolate and brown are just great great mm-hmm. uh, yeah I've been, I've been using a lot of bairds and wireman's and um uh, i think crisp uh yeah i've been, I've been using a lot Very of their sp- been using a lot of their specialty malts and i've been loving it do you carry any of like local maltsters like craft maltsters in your shop yeah we have some barn owl we have mm-hmm. uh we carry whatever they make seasonally they're so busy just making all of their grain for breweries to order that we just try and 
get a few bags when we can. So we have some short grown Pilsner, which is great for uh, like Brett beers and stuff like that. And uh, we usually get Pilsner, Vienna, Pale Ale, as often as we can. It's beautiful malt. Nice. Well, there's a new maltster open up out here in Ottawa called uh, Mrs. Big Mills Malting Company. Brand okay. new. You might want to check them out. Uh, and they're fantastic. Dean's fantastic. Okay, what's it called again? Mississippi Mills Malting Company. M I S S I S S I P P I. It's just like how you spell Mississippi. Okay, I'll check it out. Yeah. So I had Dean on the show and he was just waiting for the CSA uh, certification. He's now up and running and the malt that he had produced is already all gone for unreal it's, it's like wow so i've begged him to put a couple of sacks on the side for me so i when i go up to go see him like i just pay him for it and i could just store it somewhere cool and dry in my house <laughs> and that's it absolutely that's epic so what are what are some of the trends i mean you have a really fantastic bottle shop i've seen that your bottle shop like online it sure. looks fantastic um are you seeing that it's mostly IPAs that local breweries are putting out right now? Because it's like for me, I'm seeing you throw a stone, you hit an IPA. Yes, um, it seems as if you're a brewery, you must make a hazy IPA, and you must make a seltzer. These are two things. I, I know, I know. Yeah, uh, people like seltzer and uh, the hazy IPAs and pastry stouts, yep. things like that. Uh, people really like those um, and loggers as well though mm -hmm. I think there's everything has come full circle from can you make the most bitter hoppy beer now people want a pilsner or lager and I'm the same way uh, I just want to drink a beer you know sometimes at the end of the day I just want to drink a beer I want to drink two beers exactly and the other night I, I had some company over for the Habs game and I, I thought it'd be fun to drink a 10 10.5% Bellwoods, Third Moon, Triple IPA or something. Oh, dear God. <laughs> and I went to the other room and I lied down. I'm like, I'm just going to close my eyes for 30 seconds. And I passed that was out. It for, that was it for the night. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. So sticking to the Pilsners, I think Pilsners are really good. And uh, a lot of great breweries are, are making Pilsners. I think that's pretty exciting as well. And uh, just as challenging to make this a hazy beer because there's nothing to hide behind. That's yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. Are homebrew shops now becoming more integral in the homebrew community? Are you finding? They, yeah. Um, I, I think it's important to have a good local homebrew supply store, LHBS. You know, it's a place where people can congregate, a, pe a place where people can uh, learn from homebrewing, see all the stuff. And especially in the days of Amazon, where, you know, you, you can't call Amazon and ask them about, pitch rates or yeah you know stuff like that um so yeah I, I think it's really important and i'm excited to be able to provide the service of helping people brew great beer like that is such profit in itself is helping people make great beer and then drinking great beer like that's such a, a cool thing to do what are some of the things that you want to see maybe change in the homebrew world for maybe be it equipment be it the culture be it uh ingredients or interaction with companies uh, i think sustainability is key making sure that you know we're we're brewing sustainably and it's uh, a hobby that isn't you know over consuming mm -hmm. uh, especially in my shop you know we're trying to move from everything's in plastic like we we love putting things in plastic as human beings Mm -hmm. So even like every single package of grain is in plastic. So we're moving to craft bags wherever we can. And we're trying to work with companies to limit packaging, change the way we get packaged things. You know, if we order a hundred or something, you don't need to put in a hundred small bags. No, just, give it to us. just give it to us. Um, and uh, yeah, things like that. And I, I just think everyone needs to get on board with that and put the, um, you know, the survival of the planet and uh, rehabilitation of the planet at the forefront of, you know, your mission and uh, of being a company 
uh, you know, and your purpose because, you know, no planet, no beer, no water, no beer, yeah, uh, no bees, no pollination, none of this stuff happens. So, and, and also it's just our planet. Like you gotta, you gotta save it. So we gotta make sure. I think that's what I would like to see out of everyone. Everyone needs to get on board with that and work together to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, oh, now the cat's out of my throat. <laughs> so um, are you guys going to be doing the, um, I think you ran the GTA or were a part of the GTA Brews, uh, Brew Slam, uh, I think a year or so ago. Yes. Yeah, we, we've been the, the title sponsor for a few years, and we host the beer drop-off, so you can drop off your beer as a drop-off location, and uh, yeah, so that is going to be done as well. I had some correspondence with uh, Eric Kuzno, the founder, and we're going to be doing some sort of Zoom judging thing. Nice. Yeah, yeah it's happening. It's happening in some new form. Nice. Cause I just did the um, national homebrew competition for the American homebrewers. And I was just like, Oh, this is going to be fun. Then I saw how many people entered. They had like 26,000 bottles to go through. Yeah. That, that was nuts. Wild. Yeah. So that's uh, pretty crazy stuff. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I gave four beers, two did well, two did bad. And I'm like, eh, it's all good. But the, the idea of trying to get something out of that, just seeing that two beers were like they did from one star to five stars. I had two beers hit four stars. That made me feel good. That made me feel good. So I'll nice. take it. I'll take Congrats. it. Congrats Thanks, man. For sure. So is there anything that you think people should know about the for anything that's up and coming or anything that they should they should look at for their home breweries that they should maybe for equipment they should have? Um equipment that you should have you know a, a stir plate is always great if you're doing large beers it, you know if you're brewing a double ipa or doing an ipa and you want to just use one pitch of liquid yeast or one pack of dry yeast ramping up it with a, a stir plate uh, is really important uh inkbert temperature controller if you just have, you know, a simple setup, you can turn any fridge into a temperature control chamber for like 50 bucks. So that's pretty good. Um, and also try and get into water chemistry. Um, yeah, no. That's the final frontier. It's it's the most scary part. Daunting, from, intimidating. Yeah, it's, daunting. It's, it's daunting, but just watch a few videos online and try and like, it's just like salt and pepper on a steak, right? And seasoning. If, if you look at a recipe, you're like a teaspoon of cumin. What? <laughs> but, but, you know, <laughs> but, but when you start getting into it, you see what everything does and how it's just salt and pepper for your beer. And it's, it's not difficult at all. And with, you know, a little bit of equipment and watching a few YouTube videos that will take your beer from, four stars to five stars that's what makes the five star beer you're not going to get to five stars without it okay good to know good to know that's it all right so is there anything else you want to pass on to anybody um i would just say uh you know um uh, i think it's such a great hobby now i think it's given people an opportunity to uh you know especially during these these times to find a source of, uh, of passion and energy and expression and, uh, you know, creativity, I think it's really fun. So just go all in. And if, uh, you're thinking of making it, you know, not, there's never been a better time to turn it into your passion and start your own business. And, uh, as someone who's, you know, turned it into a hobby, into a business, I highly recommend it. It's a labor of love. And, uh, yeah, go for it. Start your brewery, ramp up your home brewery, start your podcast, start your collaborations, whatever you're doing, just go for it and go all in. Double down. Awesome. Triple down, even. <laughs> triple, triple IPA, sure. <laughs> Zach, thank you very much for your time today, bud. I greatly appreciate it. I know you're a busy guy. I will not keep you. Um, guys, if you ever get a chance, and if you're in the Toronto area, 
and you're you are a home brewer this is the store to go to check out their two locations you will not find a better group of guys to help you out to one to get you kitted out two to help you make sure you're going in the right direction and three to make sure you don't screw things up if you do it's not their fault is yours don't worry about it we've all been there so Again, guys, thanks a lot for coming along for a ride and a beer or two along the way. And uh, stay tuned because probably uh, we're going to be doing a live show probably in and around uh, maybe the 2nd of July with Horst Dornbusch, who is the absolute authority in all things German beer. So, guys, thanks a lot, and we'll see you on the other side. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan.